Here is an update on my research I've been doing since the mid-1990s. This is a Wimhurst machine, and I have it set up with some belts made out of vacuum tubing. And they hook off to a couple of motors, which I think it might be too dark to see them correctly. But they have... Um, I didn't know how to build a Wimhurst machine when I made this, so these are... Uh, zinc coated steel segments and there are 50 of them a disc and I've had it set up to where the discs moved exactly the same RPM um, as each other but in opposite directions or I've had them variable speed which is how the machine is set up now and it did some really weird things my friends have dubbed this the curious device so that's what I call it. It's in a relatively strong wooden frame. I can run it vertical or horizontal and have done both. Um, it made a field around it when running. Oh, better tell you how I set it up. Didn't set it up like a standard Wimhurst machine. I removed half of the shorting bars. So there. So all I have is one shorting bar per disc right now. And maybe that's a better view of the other side. It's just a single copper wire to the center. Nope, that's not visible. Anyway, when I removed half of the shorting bars and I got rid of all the voltage collection pickup points, uh, the field, the voltage alternated polarity back and forth about every one second. Uh, didn't really matter too much the RPM I ran it at. It would still be about once a second, maybe to three quarters of a second, up to one and a half seconds. And the field it made around this thing, I mapped it out with several things. Uh, this being one of them, it's a, what is this, 400, oh no, 698 and a half ohms of number 34 wire is in this. It's shielded. The battery used to be inside, but I liked changing it. The only output is an LED, so the frequency it runs at is relatively low. And all it does is take the back EMF and put it into an LED. So if you put something magnetically conductive, the LED gets brighter. Pull it out, the LED gets dimmer. I realize people want digital displays on things now. I built this in the 90s, so I probably need to update it. But I mapped out a field with that and with compasses, and it made a field, I don't know, about 10 foot in diameter. When it was on, it might have been 15 foot. Uh, if it hadn't run for four or five days, would drop down to about five foot or three foot in diameter. Um, it did some really weird things. Uh, the magnetic field near these segments was strong enough to where it would rewrite a compass very, very easily. Uh, you had to be careful with the compasses. And I know super strong magnets can do that, but this is sheet metal. Like It shouldn't have been doing that as far as I was concerned. Now I know why it did it. Um, some interesting properties of it is it would mess with basically the flow rate of time. If you took a little watch and put it inside, um, it would tick off the seconds kind of randomly within that second or so it was flipping back and forth. Uh, if you took it back out again, it would go to complete normal. It would synchronize where it was, but it would mess with it in the short term. It didn't matter if it was digital or mechanical clocks. I tried all of it. It's weird to watch a mechanical clock tick off three seconds in nothing flat, but that's the most it ever really got to. And then sit there and hold, and then click time off. So that was a weird thing it did. Uh, made a field where the machine was. Also made a field around the machine. So I could set up the machine and run it in one spot, turn it off, separate the two, and they would be linked electromagnetically. So my cordless phone signal went clean through it. It made the signal go wherever I took uh, wherever I took the device because the other field was where I had run it before at home. Uh, most people ran away from this thing; they didn't like it at all. Um, basically, it appeared to amplify any personality imbalances, thoughts you had. You're a little paranoid about some weird device; you would be super paranoid afterward. Um, I spent enough field time in the field that. I don't know, I used it spiritually as a balancing tool because if you weren't perfectly balanced, it would mess you up. 
um, back to the timing thing, things like a multimeter. It writes the segments across, and it does it with timing. The displays would be garbledygook. Except this particular meter I left in the field for, I don't know, weeks. And after about three or four days, it started working again, despite it being inside the field. All the multimeter leads, those went to zero ohms. They started off at like 0.6, they went down to zero. I've got a story about how I noticed that, but they faded back up to regular continuity in about four or five years. So I'm not quite sure what happened there. I'm trying to remember the rest of the things it did. Anyway, I lost my place to live, so I put it all in storage. And uh, I've never been able to get this machine to run again, even as a standard Wimhurst machine. Um, the discs are too conductive. I tried cleaning them. I tried spraying them with lacquer again, and it just doesn't work. I would need to start over. If I did, I would use 48, not 50 segments. Um, so I started playing with other stuff. I built um, all kinds of various experiments. I built two custom six-phase power supplies to run various configuration coils. Uh, here is the smashed remains of the last one I tried. The reason I built two of these is I was trying phased arrays and other type stuff to try to get interesting results. It didn't seem to do much, and I think it's because I didn't have the right sensors. So because I was used to the time being off, I built this thing. It's got two 20 megahertz clock generators on it. It compares the signal and puts the output to an LED. Um, so at first it flashed about one and a half seconds or so. They were pretty close to each other. The moment I got it around uh, that other device, it just, the frequencies were so far off that it's not been a useful device since. So um, I also tried an accelerometer. I made a shielded accelerometer setup. Now that you can get this in a smartphone, there's no particular reason to be building something like this unless you're going to hook it to an oscilloscope. Uh, magnetic field sensors, they sort of help. Uh, this little guy, the magnetic permeability sensor, that I think is really uh, an important test device to have. I want to make one for capacitance because the capacitive, just check the capacitance in a vacuum and see. Now, because of uh, Bob Greenier's uh, recommendation to use a PN junction to be able to pick this stuff up, I love that idea. I can build that detector. And because of this book here, it tells me how. Because these people have built that detector. They started off with radioactive decay, but that's big and expensive to build. They figured out that a PN junction did the same thing. And what they decided to do was, well, most of the engineering on the silicon, they want it quiet. They don't want it noisy. So they've designed that out of the forward bias on most of the diodes. The reverse bias on regular diodes hasn't been engineered to be clean. But then again, the voltage is really high. Standard xenodiodes are meant to be clean. So what you want is a small signal transistor, like a 2N222, and you reverse bias uh, the base emitter junction. And that will get you something with a low enough voltage to actually um, design with. And um, you should get the noise out and be able to pull your, your detector signal out of that. So that's my next plan, because playing with these guys is, um, I don't know, I don't have the right sensors. They just seem like my other stuff. They're not doing anything that useful. Uh, plus, it's really hard to get a bunch of power into these things. Uh, I tried a, my last try to impedance match them was a microwave oven transformer, uh, putting 120 volts into the... I'm sorry, putting the audio signal, the 30 hertz, 60 hertz, into the 120 volt section and pulling out the signal for the filament voltage. Uh, the problem is these things aren't that low resistance. Uh, I'm going to try one of those gun style soldering irons and use that to drop the impedance, but I think I'm going to have to wind a custom transformer. Something happened odd yesterday. I've got my signal generator and my audio amplifier here. And uh, I was using resistors, but I gave up on the resistors. They're, they're 
too much heat. Anyway, um, when I turned off my signal generator, it messed with the processor in this thing and caused a full reset um, right when I turned it off. So I'm wondering if a field didn't decay and do something. Of course, it could just be random chance, but it's never done that before. So, for whatever that might be worth. Anyway, um, oh, more on other experiments that I've been doing. Um, I think it's Richard Banderic had this idea that you um, make a capacitor and one plate's spinning and the other one's fixed. Um, I used a complete insulator. It's just a honeycomb pattern. And uh, I put ions into it. And anyway, uh, that's my last video posted if you want to go check that out and see. Um, didn't comment much on that design. That's supposed to create unequal force. So I was trying that uh, because in this machine here, it uh, definitely tapped gravity. About 1% or so through shielding. Now I know how it can get through shielding. So um, anyway, I knew it was possible, but it mostly happened when the voltage polarity flipped. Right in the middle of that flip is when it would tap gravity. Um, which makes me worry about, I don't know, the sun flipping magnetic polarities. I wonder what would happen if it were in presence of a lot of voltage while it did it. Anyway, since this thing didn't get any clear results, I mean, it did move some, but I had high voltage on around it. It wasn't in a sealed box. So I built another device of which I broke a few minutes ago, accidentally tripped on it. Anyway, I built two of these things with motors, uh, hoping that I could uh, try to simulate what this thing did, uh, but without the segments. And, um, I don't know, it all seems so similar to me, but uh, I have given up running that thing, mostly because after running these little guys, um, I did end up with a, I don't know, it looked like a burn that started from the inside of my skin. And yes, it could have been allergies, could have been a bug bite, but it was kind of splotchy, didn't have a center point like a bug bite, and uh, it did heal mostly. There's a single pock mark left, a little over a quarter inch diameter where the skin is just kind of destroyed. Makes me realize I probably need to set up some shielding um, because I don't want to mess with this stuff. Anyway, this thing did really bad things to people, and uh, I have had lifelong health problems. Uh, hopefully they haven't been caused by this, but they might have been. Wouldn't surprise me at all. And uh, some of my next experiments are I want to try these guys and I want to put them in the middle of an electrostatic lifter because I think that would simulate more closely what this did when it was messing with gravity. Um, just simply imbalance the field. Uh, I'm not sure how well that's going to work, but I want to try it. Uh, but I need detectors first, because if I don't know what I'm doing, just like the six-phase power supply and all that, I built these coils, I built lots of different formats of coils, and never could get anything that was super noticeable, but I didn't have the right detectors. I'm trying to think if I forgot anything. Anyway, uh, I've looked a lot into shaman-type things and all kinds of well, how does consciousness interact with physics uh, this thing certainly interacted with um, consciousness. Uh, I hadn't realized that I should be focusing willpower around and try altering reality like it was a dream when this was running back when I was using it. Uh, I think small fields like this are going to be not super helpful for that. I think the field needs to be big enough to where you're absolutely in the middle of it because that's how this thing worked. Uh, if you were in the middle of the field, you were okay outside the field, not so much. Um, and where did I leave it? Anyway, there's um, an idea called Magvid. And this is something that I... There it is. Um, this document here. By the way, if you want any of these books, I've got them all on PDF. Just email me. My username is the same on my YouTube channel as it is for my Gmail account. Last character is a zero, uh, not a capital O. But anyway, I built this thing, and it's... Um, I thought it was the field forces for a long time. Didn't realize it was the ions. 
but uh, turns out the field forces don't do anything on their own. Uh, it needs ions, but now that I look at how it works, it's an interaction of the magnetic fields and the ions, so you need both. And I did not inject ions into the air and try to make it work that way, so I didn't get anything from this. But if you read the rest of this document, it's crazy. Um, anyway, I think it does seem to interact with consciousness, or at least as he describes it, it certainly does. Um, anyway, I don't know how many other people that are physicists have researched down the shaman road a huge amount, but I, um, I'm convinced this reality is made out of the same stuff the dream worlds are, and it just takes a lot more willpower, energy, whatever, to alter this world than it does the standard dream worlds. I think the physics is basically the same. Gravity still is in my dreams. The experiments I run in my dreams, the gravity um, coefficient is different, but everything else appears to be the same. Anyway, I think there's incredible potential here, and uh, that's what I've done so far. Any questions, leave them in the comments. I read all of them. Goodbye. Okay,